I'm, I'm really very happy to introduce Jeff Hollinger, who's here uh, from Oregon State. I first got to know Jeff in 2005, dated, uh, dating Jeff and I <laughs> here, uh, when he showed up as a first year grad student. And uh, over the next five years, he did this phenomenal thesis. And if you're not familiar with this thesis, what Jeff worked on was how would you get a team of robots to search for something in the physical world? So in all kinds of different environments, in kind of tunnel-like environments and in maze-like environments, how would you get uh, them to look for something um, and look at all different kinds of cases? Look at the case where you could guarantee that if there was a target, it would be found and uh, irrespective of how fast that target was moving. Uh, think about variations as to what would be the most efficient strategy and then some combination of this guaranteed and efficient strategy. So he actually ended up doing a phenomenal thesis and you know people don't read too many theses these days but that would be, if, you, if it's this area about multi-robot coordination, I highly recommend uh, Jeff's thesis. Since then he's been at uh, USC working, uh, did a postdoc with Gaurav uh, Sakatme uh, for a number of years and then uh, been at uh, uh, Oregon State. And I'm very happy to see that he, you know, he's found a real great area to specialize in, which has to do with marine robotics. So I'm going to let you tell, uh, let him tell you all about about his recent work. Welcome. Great, thank you, Sanjeev. Uh, thanks for everyone uh, for coming uh, and for having me here. Coming back to CMU, it, it always really feels like coming home for me. So. Um, and thank you, Sanjeev, for, for summarizing my thesis, because uh, I'm not talking about that today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the work that I've been doing in pretty much the last eight years since I left CMU, uh, which is in the area of marine robotics. Um, and what we're interested in in my lab is we don't really build the vehicles. We mostly buy the vehicles and sometimes modify them. But what we're interested in, in is what's going on under the hood. So the planning, the decision making, and the learning that's going to optimize the behaviors of these vehicles in order to gather better information in the physical world for whoever the end user is, be it the Navy or oceanographers um, or whoever's using them. So before I get into the, the work that we've been doing, I wanted to just talk a little bit about what was going on while I was here at CMU. So in 2005 through 2010, there were a lot of really exciting projects, and don't be offended if you know, your project's not here. There are just two that I want to highlight because I want to highlight kind of the similarities and the differences between these two different problems. So in 2005, the, the DARPA Grand Challenge was going on. People were looking at self-driving cars, how they drive through the desert, how can we develop the planning, the perception, the mapping capabilities in order to basically get from point A to point B. There was also this project, DepthX, that Dave Wettergreen, George Cantor, a few other folks here uh, were working on in collaboration with, with Stone Aerospace and some others, where they were looking at this underwater vehicle that could go in and it could map a sinkhole in Mexico. And it could bring a 3D map back of what was going on down there, which gave you some idea of sort of the physical conditions um, and was useful for geologists and, and scientists. So if we think about these two problems, obviously self-driving cars have become huge. Many people have gone on to do amazing careers in this area. Some people who worked on DepthX actually ended up doing self-driving cars, um, but that's another story. Um, so self-driving cars are all about getting from point A to point B. Right? But problems like this, and a lot of the marine robotics problems, are more about gathering information. So how do we gather the best information? How do we get the best 3D map? Or how do we get a 3D map that's useful to the geologist um, or the end user? And these are the kinds of problems that I'm really interested in and that we've been working on in my lab. So zoom forward to 2018, um, eight fast years later. Um, what's going on in marine robotics? today. Well, there's a lot of exciting stuff going on with the hovering autonomous underwater vehicle that Michael Kess here works on, um, which can do in-water ship hull inspection and can build 3D maps of ship hulls, um, figure out what's going on in terms of have explosive devices been placed on those hulls, is there damage to the hull, all that great stuff. That sort of close-in inspection, close-in 3D mapping that's being done with these vehicles has some similarities to the DepthX project is, um, in, in some sense. And we do some work in that area, but that's not really what I'm going to be focusing on today. What I'm going to be focusing on today is this idea of long-duration autonomy. And marine robotics in the ocean is a place where we can go out for weeks or months at a time which is different from a lot of other scenarios. I mean, you guys probably think about turning your robot on for 10 minutes or an hour, and if it works, you're fairly happy, if you get the video, of course. Um, but with these kinds of vehicles, 
um, and I'm going to talk more about this platform here. This is an underwater glider, so it's buoyancy driven. So all it does is it shifts around a weight inside of it, it uh, inflates or deflates a bladder, and these are very low power consumption things. Contrast that to what a quadcopter has to do in order to stay in the air, right? So this vehicle can stay out there for really long periods of time, and it can gather data. And so what can it gather data about? Well, it can gather data about things like red tides, um, which are very important because uh, in terms of environmental and ecological sustainability. This was a fish kill that happened in Redondo Beach Harbor where a huge number of tuna um, were found just sort of floated to the surface and dead um, in this harbor area and then scientists and, and roboticists came in and were trying to figure out what had happened and why had this happened. Um, and law enforcement and military are also using these vehicles in order to sort of secure our coastal waterways and, and those sorts of things. And these vehicles are aided by satellites that also give you information about the marine environment. So now think about the scales of this kind of an information gathering problem and what you need to do in order to sort of optimize the information that you get. And those are the kind of problems that we're interested in. Okay, so this is what we do. This is why we're excited about um, marine robotics. Um, so what's the problem? You know, what is it that we're trying to solve here? Well, the issue, one of the issues with marine robotics is that the current state of practice is as such. Um, and this is what happens at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Ambari, Oregon State, University of Southern California, Rutgers, don't be offended, MIT, if, if I left you out. Um, so various different places across the country that are operating these vehicles. Um, basically, an operator pre-specifies some waypoints. And the vehicles are built well enough that they can follow these waypoints. And so that's useful, right? And then they bring the data back. They bring data about things like temperature, salinity, chlorophyll content, those kinds of low-level quantities, or maybe some acoustic data about what's going on on the ocean floor or in the water column. And then a team of experts looks at that data and says, hmm, well, based on this data, I think we should send the vehicle over there. It's over here now, let's send it over there. So it's this very ad hoc method for doing this, where they're clearly not doing any kind of sophisticated data processing of what's coming in. They're basically just using their intuition to try to figure out where to send the vehicle next. And so the goal of what we're doing is this idea of marine autonomy. And in order to get to this, this marine autonomy, we need to be able to do in situ decision making. So the vehicle needs to be able to make decisions on its own as data comes in. It needs to be robust to errors, so if the vehicle fails, we need to be able to detect those failures, we need to recover from those failures, and ultimately that's leading toward this idea of shared autonomy with the technicians. So we don't want to take the technicians or the oceanographers, the mission commanders out of the picture entirely, because again, you know, they have years of experience, they've been doing this for a long time, um, but we also want to be able to augment that with additional capabilities in terms of the vehicle being able to analyze the data and make these decisions um, on its own. So this is the goal, this is sort of the motivation, this is what's currently going on. Um, and in today's talk, I'm gonna talk about sort of two research threads that go toward this goal of uh, marine autonomy. So within the sort of the broad area of marine robotics, we've been working on sort of underwater data collection, and this is focusing on improving the autonomy, improving the path planning capabilities of these vehicles, and then also human robot teaming. And that's focusing more on what's the role of the operator in these kinds of systems, how do we learn those preferences, how do we, how do we utilize those preferences, within a framework um, that allows us to, to basically generate better trajectories and ultimately to get better data back um, from these oceanographic environments. Okay, so talking about underwater data collection and talking about the planning problems inherent in that, this is the vehicle that I mentioned before. This is a, um, an animation of the Oregon State University Slocum Glider. Um, it's, uh, a, as I said, a buoyancy-driven vehicle, so it doesn't have a propeller, um, but it's able to, by controlling its buoyancy and controlling its weight distribution, basically glides through the ocean. Um, it typically has sensors like chlorophyll, uh, chlorophyll, temperature, salinity, sort of low-level quantities in the ocean. It also might be able to get some acoustic data and also use that acoustic data to navigate, along with dead reckoning um, and then GPS on the surface. So what can you do with, do, with this vehicle? 
Well, you can, do, you can monitor conditions after an oil spill. You can do ecological and, or environmental monitoring in terms of looking at biological hotspots and how ocean systems and processes evolve. You can look at physical oceanography processes like upwellings and eddy conditions and those kinds of things that those folks are very interested in. Any kind of marine energy in terms of renewable energy, wave energy sensing, and then also offshore facility inspection, which is of a lot of interest to um, oil and gas company and, and, and those kinds of things. So lots of applications, lots of interest in these kinds of vehicles. The problem is that if I were a really risk averse individual, I wouldn't put one of these gliders out in the ocean at all, right? We've lost them in the past. Um, virtually every long-term glider uh, operator that I've met has lost at least one of these vehicles because things happen, right? There are failures. And one failure that people talk about a lot is the idea of it being hit by a passing ship. So the glider has to surface for two reasons. One, in order to get a GPS fix, which helps it to correct its dead reckoning. The folks at the Robotics Institute understand why that's a problem. Um, and also, uh, it needs to be able to beam the data back home. Once the vehicle's underwater, it might have very low bandwidth acoustic communication, but it doesn't have the kind of terrestrial modes that you're used to, like radio or Wi-Fi or cellular. Um, and so it needs to, to surface in order to get that data back to the operator, to the home base, um, and also to get an idea of where it is. So, okay, um, interesting. Well, probably a good thing to do would be to avoid harbors and shipping lanes and places where you see passing ships. This is an actual AUV from uh, the USC lab that I was working in at the time that had fortunately survived the incident, but the fin was damaged uh, by a passing ship. So if I gave you this problem and I said, well, the vehicle starts up here and it's going here, um, and I want it to avoid these shipping lanes here so that it's a safe operation, then you might tell me, oh, well, that's an easy planning problem. All I have to do is I might just surface here. You know, maybe I'm not allowed to stay underwater for too long because then the dead reckoning error is gonna blow up and I have a bunch of information that hasn't been sent back. So what if I try to surface in these places? That'll avoid the shipping lanes. That'll get me from my start to my goal, easy enough. But what happens if you do this? So this is an actual route that was run by a glider um, at USC. You see that it surfaces um, and there's a big correction when it surfaces in terms of where it is. So it's using dead reckoning, it surfaces at these waypoints, and there's this big jump in terms of um, where it lands, wh where it ends up at the surface. And so if I told you that the shipping lanes here are the white parts, so these sort of white lines, then what you'll see is that in this trial, the glider actually surfaced in every single shipping lane. Okay, so this is not indicative of the kind of safe behavior that we're looking for with these kinds of vehicles. So even though we gave it these waypoints that were safely outside the shipping lanes, that's not what actually happened when we ran the vehicle. So why, right? Why is this the case? Well, the answer to that is that we have ocean currents that are also disturbing uh, the vehicle, and if we don't account for them in the planning process, then we're not gonna get out what we thought we were going to get out. We're gonna get some kind of a different trajectory. So the work that we've been doing um, in this area is risk-aware planning. So we think about, all right, we're given some waypoints to visit um, by the oceanographers. We're trying to find some minimum risk path that, that meets some criteria. So this is a constrained optimization problem. So we want to minimize this risk, minimize the risk of hitting passing shipping traffic, um, minimize the risk of running aground, various things that can cause damage to the vehicle, um, while satisfying a constraint on how long we remain submerged, um, that's one way of formulating this. Or we could think about different kinds of constraints, like when my, when my uh, memory buffer is full um, or when my dead reckoning error has, uh, has gotten to some point. So we surface after a certain amount of time, and what we can do is we can potentially calculate our expected risk using models of what's going on in the environment. I'll talk about those models later. Um, and then if we have an idea of what the expected risk looks like, of where we're going to end up, um, based on where we start and where we expect to go, then we can actually solve this using variant of MDPs, so Markov decision processes. So if you think of the states of the world as kind of uh, places in the ocean, and you think about the transitions between those states based on the ocean currents, you can formulate an MDP from that, um, and then you can solve the discrete version of that in order to get an idea of what sort of your expected risk is. But the problem is that we need models in order to do that. We need models of what the ocean currents are doing. And it turns out that you can go to the internet 
And you can download those models from something called the Regional Ocean Modeling System. And that's going to give you daily estimates of what the ocean currents are doing. And these are based on sort of models that oceanographers um, and data processors have been looking at for many years, so they're fairly well refined. And it gives you a reasonable estimate of the ocean conditions from satellite data and fused with buoy data, fused with data from other autonomous vehicles that are traveling out in the ocean, so a bunch of different sources. But what it doesn't give you is it doesn't give, an idea, give you an idea of how accurate these estimates are, right? So how much uncertainty do I have in those, these estimates? And so what I can do is we can use data-driven methods from the machine learning community to try to get an idea of what these uncertainties are, what these variances are. Um, and so a number of you have probably seen you know, Gaussian processes and this idea of the Gaussian process variance. Um, you're not going to understand it solely from this equation here. Um, but essentially what the Gaussian process variance is telling me is that if I have really dense data, then that's going to be a low noise case. You know, I'm going to have fairly low uncertainty in areas where my data is fairly dense. If I have very sparse data, um, then that's going to mean that I probably don't have a very good estimate. And this is all relative to the kernel, it's re uh, a kernel matrix, it's relative to noise variables, those kinds of things that can be learned from the data. But essentially what this tells you is, given some data, um, this will tell me is an estimate of sort of where am I most uncertain of what's going on, where am I less uncertain about what's going on. But it turns out that the satellite data that we get from these ocean models is essentially the same resolution uh, across the different parts of the ocean. So the GP variance, even though it's used a lot in robotics applications, uh, is not something that really tells me a lot here. On the other hand, a measure from the geostatistics literature that is not commonly used in robotics uh, applications called the interpolation variance actually tells me quite a bit. So what the interpolation variance is saying that if I get a measurement, Z, of what's happening in the ocean from my glider um, or from uh, a buoy or from satellite data, if that measurement varies significantly from my prediction at that point based on the model, which could be a Gaussian process or any kind of regression model, then that's going to correspond to a high uncertainty case. So basically if my model predicts something very different from my measurement, then that means that something funky is going on. That's going to correspond to high uncertainty. If my model matches up a lot with my estimate, then that's a low uncertainty case. And so this essentially measures uh, variance from data variability, and this measures variance from data density. Um, so in the ocean current prediction, the GP variance really doesn't tell me a lot at all, I'm going to argue. There's very little correlation uh, between the GP variance and this true error. Uh, and the way that we get the true error is we take the forecast from the models and we compare that to what ROMS calls the nowcast, which is the data that has already assimilated the satellite data and the buoy data from that current day. So I wouldn't know that if in the morning I put my glider in the water and I need to set it off. So this is something that I'm not going to know until the next day. And what you can see is the interpolation variance and the true error. There's definitely some qualitative commonalities between these peaks here and, and these peaks here. But with the GP variance, we're not really seeing that correlation. It's not a great correlation, right, in terms of our value. Um, but it might be enough in order to improve the operation of the gliders in these kinds of domains. So what we did was um, we ran some simulations uh, and then we ran some field trials to try to verify whether or not we could improve the glider's capabilities by using this new measure of variance. So in the risk-aware planning simulations, we looked at two different cases. One was where the vehicle was fighting the prevailing currents. So if the currents are coming at the vehicle, the vehicle's going at um, those. Turns out that these cases were somewhat different qualitatively, so we split them up. The other one is where the vehicle is riding the prevailing currents, or sort of going with those prevailing currents. And what we saw is with a case where we were fighting the currents, we got a fairly significant decrease in mission time, on average about a 40% reduction, by using the interpolation variance. Um, and in the case where we're traveling with the currents, we could really increase the mission success significantly um, by incorporating sort of this more accurate measure of uncertainty um, in the ocean currents. So this is interesting, right? In cases where we're sort of going down on the roller coaster, we can steer a little bit better. If you think about kind of the uh, you know, downhill luge type of the situation, we're able to sort of predict things better. Um, so that gives us a higher chance of mission success. Whereas when we're fighting the currents, we can reduce the mission time because we sort of avoid areas where we think the currents are going to help us, um, but they're not actually going to. So Jeff, I just want to make sure I understand like, the plot from the pink line, the 9 out of 10 and 9 out of 10. The success rate did not improve, it was the same with, with uh, 
interpolation? Is, is that right? Yeah, so the success means that it was able to complete the mission without having to abort, and it aborts when it gets too close to land. Okay, and, and I guess this, is, this was simulated? This is simulated. This is all simulated. So yeah. and, and, and failure means get close to land. And then on the bottom one, your success rate increases by, I guess, 3 over 10? Yep. Meaning you don't get close to land. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Got it. Yeah. If it's a fixed set of waypoints that we are interested in, what's the problem in navigating near the surface where you have good GPS data and only diving down at those waypoints? Uh, so the issue, well, so the issue is the way that the glider works is it, d it works in this yo-yo pattern. Um, so if you only dive a little bit, one, you're not really getting the science data that you need because often it's going to be over the whole water column. Um, and also you're going to run into problems in terms of the speed of the vehicle because it takes a while for you to, uh, to pitch up and then go up and pitch down. So you're not going to be able to move at top speed and you're also not going to be able to get data from the bottom of the ocean. Okay, so here's another video. Um, if we take a look at this, um, now you'll notice this is using the risk-aware planning technique. Um, when the vehicle surfaces, you're not going to see a jump. So the red vehicle um, is the path that the vehicle actually took. The yellow vehicle is the path um, if we had uh, just used dead reckoning um, and not used the, the surfacing. So you see the vehicle doesn't really jump when it reaches these waypoints. Um, and basically by setting these pseudo waypoints here to go to instead of the actual waypoints, um, the vehicle is able to tra traverse this, uh, basically this um, trajectory that no longer surfaces in the shipping lanes. So we're able to do that by sort of modeling the uncertainty uh, in the ocean currents uh, and plugging that into a Markov decision processing type framework. And we tested this on the vehicle. Um, this is at this point a somewhat old result and I'm going to kind of transition this and, and use this to motivate some of the more recent research. Um, so a few years back, uh, we put two gliders in the water uh, off the coast of Southern California near Catalina Island. Um, we had them start at a particular location um, and go to a goal. Um, one of them was using the MDP with the Gaussian process variance, then the other one was using the MDP with the interpolation variance. Um, and what we saw, you know, just in this one off, given that it's marine robotics and it's very expensive to, to take these vehicles off and, and, and put them all in the water at once, we saw that we kind of confirmed the trends um, from the simulation. Um, in this case, uh, the prevailing currents were coming kind of in this direction, so this is a case where we were fighting the currents. Um, this is Catalina Island. Those are some sort of fake islands that we added in there because if the algorithm failed, we didn't want to actually run aground and lose the glider. Um, but what we saw is with the GP variance, it's very tentative, right? It's not really taking any kind of behavior um, that it thinks would, would allow the vehicle to get into trouble. And so it waits and sort of loiters around the starting position for a while and then eventually continues along to the goal. Here with the interpolation variance, it does this, which seems risky, but actually because it has a better estimate estimate of the uncertainty um, in the currents, it's able to get fairly close to the island while still remaining um, essentially safe with a high probability and is able to progress to the goal um, in significantly less time. Um, so through sort of more extensive simulations um, and a single expensive time-consuming field trial, uh, we were able to, to, to confirm uh, that, that these kinds of algorithms were working. Um, but that's not the end of the story. So I showed that we could do this for risk-aware planning, but some of the more recent work that we've been doing has been looking at a similar problem in terms of energy-aware planning. Um, and the idea here is that <coughs> sort of the limiting factor in mission duration is the energy budget for these vehicles. So even though all they're doing is kind of moving this weight around and inflating and deflating this bladder, there's still this idea that we're eventually going to run out of energy after a few weeks or a month or so. And so if we can do more energy efficient planning, if we can plan trajectories, sort of utilize the currents to reduce the amount of energy that we have to um, expend, then that's going to allow us to Im improve our mission duration and expand our long-term autonomy capabilities. And so it turns out that with these kinds of glider vehicles, the ocean currents can have a large effect both in terms of where they surface, um, but also the energy expended by the AUV while it does that. And so another question is, well, how do we find an energy efficient path given that I'm trying to go from a start to a goal? So an obvious case is if I were to start here 
and end here, if I plow through these high vector, this high vector current vector field here, that's probably going to take more energy than sort of going around with the very weak currents um, and doing this, even though this is a you know, hypotenuse of the triangle, a significantly longer uh, trajectory in terms of um, the, uh, uh, the actual distance that I travel. So what we want to do is we want to be able to algorithms, uh, develop algorithms that can take advantage of that. And it turns out that sort of the discrete MDP-based <coughs> optimization algorithms that we used for risk-aware planning were not really very applicable here. They didn't really solve the problem here. And the reason for that is because these types of problems, I will argue, really requires you to optimize in continuous space. Because the ocean currents vary at different resolutions, so you need an algorithm that's able to account for that kind of multi-resolution type planning. And so the way that we were able to look at that and the algorithm we developed to solve this um, was to look at algorithms that are similar from sort of the, the chomp and stomp and trajectory optimization framework, uh, where we have some state cost that calculates the cost of going to a particular state. We have a control cost that approximates the sum of the accelerations, and we can use that as an estimate of the energy expenditure. Um, and then what we do is we estimate sort of the numerical gradient of various paths that we sample from a distribution and that allows us to find sort of energy efficient trajectories that the vehicle can potentially take. So what we call this is um, energy efficient stochastic trajectory optimization or ESTO um, and essentially what this does is it removes a very common assumption uh, from sort of stochastic trajectory optimization that the waypoints are equally spaced in time with sort of this fixed either temporal or, or spatial spacing. And so what this allows is it allows for a consideration of a wider, wider range of cost functions, including the energy efficiency cost function. Um, and so that allows us to sort of more intelligently choose the velocities and the accelerations of the vehicle um, to minimize energy expenditure. So how does this work and, and why would this be a good idea? Um, well, if we think about sort of a typical trajectory that we'd throw into a trajectory optimizer, where we have kind of evenly spaced waypoints from from start to goal. Uh, you could do things like this, right? You could change the distance between the waypoints. You could obviously change the curvature of the path by moving the waypoints around. So you can have a, you know, a coarse grid of waypoints, a fine grid of waypoints. You can have something in between. But what you can't have is you can't have a variable spacing like this, where you have basically uh, fine waypoints here and then coarse waypoints over here. And you really need this in the ocean current planning, uh, particularly energy efficiency domain, because if the currents are highly variable here, then it's a really good idea to have a, a finer spacing of waypoints at that point, because that's going to allow you to get ba basically better energy optimization. So what we do here is um, we optimize the expected cost of the trajectory, which I talked a little bit about before. Uh, previous work considered the equally spaced temporal waypoints. Um, and the reason that we weren't able to do this kind of time varying waypoint uh, uh, formulation was because the matrix algebra ended up just being too costly. You had to recalculate um, the system dynamics matrix every time step. Uh, which was just not something that you were really able to do if you were trying to do kind of a numerical gradient based method. Um, and so what we found is that we could actually factor out the spacing between the waypoints and the time difference and that allows us to basically calculate this R matrix which is necessary for calculating the computational gradient um, as sort of a factor of these matrices which are fixed and then we only had to invert the one matrix um, in order to do our uh, basically our numerical gradient optimization and that actually allowed us to to do this much more efficiently um, and in many cases in real time on the vehicle. So this was a really interesting result that allowed us to do energy efficient planning um, and what that leads to is it leads to the ability to think about various different objective functions that you know otherwise um, these kinds of stochastic planners weren't really able to consider. Um, and so we can think about energy based terms so for a particular waypoint, what's the energy expenditure with or without that waypoint? We can think about speed-based terms in terms of whether the vehicle um, is really operating at its maximum speed. Um, and then we can think about obstacle terms, which you often see in stochastic planning, in terms of where does the vehicle go? Does it hit things? Does it run into shipping lanes? So there we can fold in kind of the risk-aware planning type of approaches as well. So how well does this work? Um, so first we tested this out in sort of a synthetic environment where we just generated some 
uh, basically some, some vector fields and for these trajectories. Um, and what we see is that, so this is the sort of the simulated ocean current. Uh, this is the energy efficient trajectory optimization here in red. Um, this is sort of just the, you know, the regular um, trajectory <coughs> optimization that doesn't consider energy efficiency. And then these are some sort of A star based methods that try to come up with a grid resolution that is able to capture some of these sort of energy efficiency dynamics. And what we found is that you know, our calculation times is a little bit longer than, than not considering the energy efficiency, but not nearly as long as the discrete methods. Um, and we were able to get you kind know, of these, these methods here that we're really at the lower end of the, the energy cost. So average is better, um, but typically you'd be able to sort of keep running this planner in an anytime fashion. So you'd expect to get kind of plans that are sort of more in this range as long as you had sufficient time to, to continue running the algorithm. So basically what this leads to is it leads to more energy efficient trajectories um, in a shorter amount of time, which is really the goal for, for what we were doing here. Um, then we also looked at real ocean data um, so this is real ocean data from the regional ocean modeling system that I talked about before in the risk aware planning uh, section. So here we have uh, ocean current environment. Um, this is from just happened to be 2013 just because that's where we have fairly dense data. And so this is a situation where the algorithm sort of the initial trajectory goes through an island um, and the algorithm is able to deform that trajectory using that stochastic gradient based method um, with the pseudo inverse so that it moves away from the island and it moves into this area here where we have strong ocean currents that are helping the vehicle. So this is not only not in collision with the island, but it's also a fairly energy efficient um, trajectory. And so this is just sort of an example with some real ocean data uh, that shows us that this is working. And I'm going to talk about one more thing and then I'll get to the, the field trials that we've done um, for the energy efficient planning. So the last part of this story here, um, in terms of kind of improving the autonomy of these ocean vehicles, is thinking about you know, how do we do replanning. So initially I can predict the world from these ocean models, I get a forecast from ROMs, but during execution my glider can discover information about the world as well, and that'll tell me something about how I should refine that plan and how I should modify my mission. So this is a real case where we have a forecast from a day before, thought that the ocean currents were going to do this. And then this was the now cast from the day after that incorporates the satellite data and the buoy data and all that stuff. So you can see they're really significantly different, right? Fundamentally, you would want to take a different trajectory if you were traveling through this current field than if you were traveling through this current field. So this sort of motivates this idea of adaptive planning and planning in the loop, which is one of our sort of requirements, one of our things that we wanted from our autonomy system. So how do we develop a framework that does this? Well, so we're going to bring the Gaussian process back in. Um, so let's assume there's an underlying function uh, of the error of the forecast model, uh, which we can model using a Gaussian process or also with the interpolation variance that we saw in the previous section. Um, we then use that Gaussian process to update our forecast and then plan on it as we go along and we get more information about the environment. And so what we're trying to calculate here is the probability that this replanned path <coughs> is better than the current path, right? So I find this new path that has taken into account this information, um, and I want to see, you know, is that better than the current path that I have? Well, this is actually very difficult to calculate analytically because it takes into account both uncertainty in the environment um, and also uncertainty that your planner has actually found the optimal trajectory. Because this is a stochastic gradient based method, it's not necessarily going to get me the optimal trajectory. Um, so I want to be able to you know, calculate this in a way that's, that's reasonably efficient. So what we did is we came up with some heuristics in terms of basically trying to compare you know, the best trajectory uh, with one that, uh, you know, the new trajectory with the one that I already have. So the easiest thing to do is to basically say, well, I'll always accept the new one. We can think about, well, is the new one different enough that it's worth attempting? Uh, we can think about, well, what's the expected cost from the Gaussian process between the trajectories? And then we can also think about sampling approaches that try to approximate that probability directly, but at the cost of significantly more computation. And so what we found was basically anything that uses the expectation from the Gaussian process um, is able to do significantly better um, in terms of energy cost than sort of the pre-planned approach. And this here is essentially if you were planning on the now cast. So that's the information that you don't have. So this is sort of a, sort of a lower bound on how well we could do um, in terms of planning on the now cast data. And this is what we want to do better then. So we are able to do that 
you know, with significant computation in the sampling approach and with even less computation if we're just doing kind of the, the uh, estimated projection from the GP. So we haven't uh, implemented this on the gliders yet, but we have done some field trials on autonomous boats in a lake. Uh, and so we performed some field trials at Kirk Lake in uh, Eugene, Oregon. You notice that the Oregon weather is very similar to the Pittsburgh weather from that photo. Um, and in small lakes like, uh, small boats like this on these kinds of lakes, um, you can use wind as an analog for the ocean currents. So if there's a strong wind across this lake, um, then you end up with uh, basically strong disturbances that lead to the vehicle moving around in a similar way. Um, and so this vehicle, which is actually developed by um, Paul Sherry's group, uh, Paul Sherry's company uh, out of uh, Platypus Lutra, um, and it's controlled by a Ross Space Station computer. We have a sonic sensor to measure wind, um, and there's a LiPo battery that I can measure the voltage drop um, over the course of this lake. So this is a really nice test bed in terms of testing out some of these energy efficient planning based approaches um, without having to necessarily go all the way out into the ocean. So comparing a few different things, um, the Oracle starts out with a map of the wind that was created by doing a prior survey of, of the lake, which is not something you typically have. The replanning approach starts with no map, but replans as we gather information. So that's kind of the full um, technique. And then the naive plan just plans with no knowledge of the wind. Um, and we look at kind of the total voltage drop across five trials on each of these, um, and we see that by doing a pre-survey and doing pre-planning, we get about a 20% improvement, and then doing the replanning where we don't have prior information but we're uh, changing on the fly, that gets us about a 13% improvement. So we are doing you know, significantly better um, over this sort of naive approach that isn't considering the wind um, based on these sort of uh, field trials on the, on the boats. And we're hoping to implement, on, implement it on the gliders in collaboration with Naval Research Lab uh, in the coming year. So first part, uh, we talked about a planning framework that uses interpolation variance to predict uncertainty. We talked about how you can do risk-aware trajectory planning in ocean currents by leveraging that interpolation variance. And then we also talked about a stochastic trajectory optimization uh, method that allows for energy efficient planning. Um, so before I get into the next part, um, let me ask if there are some quick questions about the, uh, the underwater data collection work. Yes, Chris. So I'm just curious about your method. If you have two strategies, one goes to the left of that island, and well, slide 21 is perfect. Okay. Here's what I found on the for Thank you. <laughs> uh, so you showed us something that went above the island. Yeah. I can imagine not that goal, but a different goal where it was optimal to go below the island. Does your approach resolve those two different strategies or find the global optimum? Or do you have to feed it some information to say, how about we go below the island? Um, in practice, it does a pretty good job. In theory, there's no guarantee, right? So it is dependent on what the starting strategy looks like. Okay, if so you, if you started a, it to go that way in its refinement. Um, well, so there's sort of a little trail of bread crumbs in the ocean currents up there, which you can't really see because it has the trajectory on there. But there, there's sort of small currents here that sort of help you get towards, get, do this part more, more energy efficiently. And then that leads you to keep deforming this and eventually get off the island and, and go here. Okay. And if you didn't have that, you could very well end up on the other side. Unless you, had a, in, unless you started with an initial trajectory that, that helped you to do that. Yeah. One more question. So you initialize this with these ocean current, current models, right? So they, they're created from some sensor buoy and some computational modeling and so on. And, then and the satellites, end, mostly satellites. And satellites. And then they're basically sampled in some grid fashion. But so they'll have some regions that are more certain than other regions. But they, won't, they don't know anything about that. The models don't tell you anything about that. So that's where the interpolation variance that our method has to calculate is going to give you that information. Okay, so, but is there something particular, right, so you're getting the sampling and you don't get the uncertainty, but um, you do know whether buoys are launched or they don't tell you that? Uh, it's all integrated into one model, so that information has basically been lost by the time that gets downloaded from the internet. You could use that information. I mean, basically, you could, 
thing is, you'd have to have the relative, relative accuracy of the buoys versus the satellite versus any other data, which is also not available. So, right. I mean, in some sense, the way they create these models is some variant of what you're It's doing. It's a black box, yeah, basically. It's some CFP or something. Like yeah, this. so you could maybe use it, but it would be difficult. Okay, so let's move. Yeah, Sanjeev. What is the online data? Like how do you figure out what the, whatever information it's collecting while it's actually in motion? What is that? It's like some sort of a, a pressure sensor or trying to find the difference between the way it's trying to go and where it ends up going? That just, you can, um, uh, so there are a couple of different, depends on what you have on the vehicle. So if you have a DVL or an AD, what's called an ADCP on the vehicle, the, that is a sonar sensor that directly measures the current under the vehicle. Um, if you don't have that, you'd have to do some kind of difference between where you were at one point and where you were at another point. Okay, so let's, uh, <coughs> next about uh, 15 minutes or so, talk a bit about human-robot teaming. Um, so here, kind of going back to some of the motivation that we were talking about at the beginning of the talk, um, humans bring a lot of expert knowledge to the table in these ocean planning uh, domains. Uh, robots bring a lot of data processing capabilities that you know, humans are not very good at looking at large quantities of data streaming at you on a computer screen, or even not really particularly good at looking at large vector fields or large heat maps and trying to understand what's going on there. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to leverage these complementary strengths. So we have some historical data coming in that leads us to some risk and information maps like we saw in the previous section. That's gonna give us a cost function, which we already talked about. But now the new idea is that we're gonna get some initial path from a scientist or from an operator, and then we're gonna to try to refine that to develop better candidate plans and then give some, some selections to the scientist that they can then use to develop a final plan. So what does this problem look like? Well, we have the shipping lanes that we talked about, we have the ocean currents that we already talked about, and then we also have these, say, ecological hotspots. So say that we have some kind of an information quality map that either the operator gives us um, or that we've learned, um, and we want to be able to um, essentially kind of hit these hotspots while also avoiding the shipping lanes, all while accounting for these disturbances and uncertainties. And uncertainty. So this is sort of the full-scale problem now that I've um, gotten up to here. You might also want to think about energy-efficient planning as well, though I won't talk about that here. So can we do this within a trajectory optimization framework? So let's say I want to find this optimized trajectory, given some initial trajectory that's given by a scientist, also some risk function, um, which tells me, so what's the chance of being hit by a ship or running aground, and also this deviation function that basically tells me how much have I deviated from this initial trajectory that was provided to me by the operator. Um, so what does that mean, right? So risk, you know, we already talked about risk and how you'd calculate risk, so I can sum sort of the risk of being hit by a ship or running aground um, over my number of waypoints. And then for deviation, this basically tells me, well, if the initial trajectory provided by the scientist told me to go here, and then this is the optimized trajectory that might reduce the risk or um, in decrease uh, the amount of energy expended, um, how far off am I from that initial trajectory by this new trajectory? And it turns out that if we plug deviation and risk into a sort of an optimization type approach, we can use a similar technique with the Markov decision process, so iterative optimization, to try to find a trajectory that minimizes this sort of linear combination, or really any sort of function, of deviation and risk. And basically what this says is that if I have some state transition that uses uncertainty, so something like an interpolation variance um, or a Gaussian process variance, I have this deviation from the initial path, I have this risk that's based on the shipping activity, then I have this weighting variable that tells me you know, how much does the operator prefer to be risk averse versus, versus focusing on the vehicle executing the exact trajectory um, that was given to it. And so if I run this, if I have a discrete number of states, and I run this until convergence or pseudo-convergence, um, what that gives me is it sort of gives me a value function or a long-term cost for each of sort of the ocean states that I could go to um, based on the deviation and the risk from that initial trajectory. And then I can read a solution that's optimal with respect to the discretization from that, um, uh, from that value function. So here's an example of what this looks like. 
So again, we're back in Catalina Island. Um, and here we have uh, some user input waypoints in green. Um, we have a refined trajectory in red. And what you notice is that the user here told me to go into LA Harbor, which is a really bad idea. I don't want to do that. And also it told me to surface right in the middle of these two shipping lanes. So it's very unlikely that I'm actually going to be able to do that. There's a high likelihood that I'm going to end up in that shipping lane. So the refi refined trajectory says, what if you go here, 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 and here, and then basically keeps it the same to the southwest of Catalina Island, which is fairly safe, then you're going to avoid the, the nasty areas. You're going to have a much higher uncertainty of executing it properly. Maybe you should do that. Well, the operator might say, but I don't want to do that. Um, and the algorithm could then say, okay, well, what about these trajectories? So if I change that alpha value, which is the weighting between risk and reward, then I can get a whole sort of number of trajectories, um, a number of candidate trajectories that the operator could select based on their risk averseness uh, or their desire to basically take that trajectory um, at face value. So here's the original input one. Here's the low, low risk path that I already told you, a medium risk path that avoids the harbor but otherwise basically does everything the same, and then a high risk path that at least sort of does a little bit of a change to make things a little bit safer and a bit more reliable. So we saw these results and we said, okay, well, this is useful. We showed it to our oceanography collaborators and they said, oh, interesting, I'll try it. Um, and we said, hmm, but we might actually be able to get some information if we use this over time about the risk averseness of a particular operator or potentially to generalize that risk averseness across multiple operators. And so we said, hey, can we balance risk and reward within this framework to get a utility map or utility of operation um, that would then give us something that we could do trajectory optimization or MDP planning on that would give us basically a, a, a trajectory that's more likely to be accepted by the operator. So again, we do this in a trajectory optimization framework. Here where we're thinking about maximizing reward, uh, minimizing risk, and then we're thinking about this weighting parameter here that basically tells me how risk averse is the operator in these kinds of situations. So what we tried here is an algorithm called coactive learning. And the key idea here is that you allow an operator to modify an existing trajectory rather than provide a new one. So you think about inverse reinforcement learning, that's actually providing a trajectory. Here the operator is modifying an already given trajectory. So for instance, they may say, ooh, well this waypoint's in a really risky region, I'm going to move it up here. Um, and how much they moved it and which waypoint they moved, that tells me something about their risk averseness or sort of the underlying objective function that they're using to do their planning. Um, and so what we see is from those updates, we can now get an update to our weighting variable, so that's that alpha value, that basically tells me how much should I prioritize risk versus reward. And so we tried this on um, some oceanographers and roboticists didn't really see much of a difference. Um, we also have a, an IRB to try it on uh, you know, anybody who we, who we can, uh, can recruit. Um, and so we looked at a number of different folks on this and we saw that what we typically saw was by sort of a standard method that updates these weights iteratively, um, we diverge. So if this is our sort of target ratio um, then the estimated ratio, there's a lot of noise in the human input, so essentially the human doesn't really know what they want. Yeah, surprise, surprise. Um, but if we do a, a more refined method that uses a method of histogram smoothing, where we take all of the updates, all of the previous updates, throw that into a distribution, uh, th throw that into a histogram, and then infer a distribution of weights over that histogram, then we can get sort of typically um, up and down uh, this sort of converging estimate um, of what the target's risk averse ratio is. And so my student is completing the user studies on this. We hope to have uh, human subjects results within the next six months or so. Um, but right now we just have kind of a few initial results that basically show that by doing this, so doing this sort of inferring this distribution over the histogram, we can significantly reduce sort of the, um, the regret or the difference between you know, the decisions that I made when I didn't know the ratio versus the decisions that I would have made had I known the ratio um, based on um, kind of uh, this, this more, so more advanced method than just doing this iterative updating. So essentially what this allows us to do um, is it allows us to learn some manner of preferences from a human operator. 
Um, and now what we're working on, and, and this is still fairly preliminary work, um, is thinking about learning the operator's um, utility function using much quicker survey style ratings and ranking questions. Um, so if I were to say, hey, here's a lake, I want you to plan a trajectory over this lake, how would you rate this trajectory? Well, if I told you these are the risky areas, these are the not very risky areas, um, uh, and uh, I want to avoid you know, the, uh, the island here, uh, but, and I also want a smooth trajectory that gets from point A to point B. How many people would rate this, say, a three? Four? Five? Two? One? Okay, so mostly somewhere between, say, three and five is what people usually choose. The reason for that is it gets fairly close to the island, it avoids the risky areas, it's smooth, and it gets you from point A to point B. So it's not bad, it's not amazing, but there was a lot of discrepancy between what you chose, and it also probably took you a while to think about it in order to figure out what you were gonna choose. Now if I ask you, uh, which one of these trajectories is the best? This is, these, this is the risky area. I want a smooth trajectory that gets you from point A to point B. How many people say the middle? Right, so that was a lot easier. So what we're working on right now is combining both ratings and ranking queries in order to basically get people to sort of, to, to sort of reduce that search space of possible uh, objective functions for operators. And it turns out that we can do that um, again within a Gaussian process framework. But we have to do a few tricks. So it turns out that we can use rating, we can do, use what's called a bounded beta likelihood, um, which is just a single point at a specific value in order to get rating queries. Um, and for ranking queries, we had to do something a little bit different. We use something called the probit likelihood that allows us to do basically a, a classification likelihood that gives us the general shape of your objective function. So if I combine these, um, then I end up with, so if this is sort of the true latent function in blue, if these are my sort of ranking queries, these are my rating queries, I end up with an estimate function that looks something like this, right? So it's not perfectly the same, right? It's not exactly like that function, um, but it does give you kind of the general shape of what's going on. And our initial results that show, they're actively choosing, using an upper confidence bound type method, um, actively choosing uh, ratings and ranking queries is going to give us sort of less um, root mean squared error uh, relative to an objective function um, if we correctly choose basically either the ratings or the rankings um, that we think are going to more reduce um, the search space. Uh, we've done some simulated lake trials on this. Um, in order to basically learn this user preference, we saw that this upper confidence bound tends to work. Um, we're also doing some trials. Uh, this is a propeller-driven vehicle. I don't show that video because it makes people sick. Here. You get the idea. So it's a propeller-driven vehicle on a lake. Um, and what we did here is we tried to track um, a depth or temperature of interest within this lake and we wanted to learn the human operator's preferences for trying to find a depth and uh, temperature contour. Um, and this is sort of the um, initial depth map of the lake, which we did use, it by, which we found using a survey. Um, and this was the trajectory, probably hard to see on this projector. This was the trajectory that the human initially chose. And then this is the trajectory that the active learning algorithm chose after querying the user. Um, using the coactive learning, so using the modifying the trajectory approach. And basically you see if this is our estimated utility map, this computer gen generated trajectory seemed to actually do a better job um, of tracking that contour than even the, uh, the human operator did uh, when they were doing their initial trajectory. So this is exciting uh, preliminary results. We haven't done the field trials yet for the ratings and the ranking queries. We're also hoping to do that this year. Um, but it sort of gives us at least um, some idea that we can potentially learn the human operator's preferences in these kinds of environments. Um, so this section, uh, we were thinking about coactive learning to generate marine vehicle trajectories with the help from experts, combining rating and rankings queries, um, and then we did a proof of concept um, of an AUV on a lake. Um, some ongoing work that we're doing uh, very quickly, uh, we're looking at close in ROV inspection. Um, so the, the video should pop up shortly. Uh, this is a Cebotics VLBV vehicle. Um, and what we're looking at is transitioning from manual to automatic control 
uh, where this is a system that has some autonomy components and also some teleoperated control components. So here it's been switched to autonomous control to go back to the ship. Um, and what the operator is going to do um, is it's going to give it uh, a waypoint to go back to the, um, what it was just grasping. Um, and it will use that, uh, basically, that waypoint in order to get very close to this manipulation target. Um, so here it's operating autonomously using the onboard vehicle navigation system. <coughs> um, the operator is shortly going to take control of the vehicle um, once it reaches uh, kind of that position there. So once the operator feels that it's sufficiently close to this, uh, this grasping target, it will then switch to manual mode um, and it will complete the grasp. So it'll go in and complete the grasp. And what we found is sort of in preliminary studies that we were able to basically complete this grasping task um, in about uh, 30, uh, about 60 percent of the time um, versus not using this this kind of manual this autonomous control system in order to kind of get within the realm of where the where the grasp target was so if you're interested in talking about this um, I'll be around for the PSR uh, but I didn't really have time to get into all the specifics today okay lastly uh, Oregon State University Robotics if you're looking for a PhD or a postdoc or a faculty position um, we have a PhD and master's programs in robotics uh, since 2014. We have about 31 faculty working in related areas, about 60 grad students within this sort of graph hall collaborative space, uh, within this high bay area that we have uh, a bunch of project projects going on. We have legged, aerial, the aquatic don't usually hang out in here. You know, there's a tank, a small tank, um, but otherwise they go out in the ocean. Surface uh, and ground vehicles uh, that are, are housed in there. So lots of exciting projects. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, our funding from ONR and NSF, uh, faculty collaborator at USC, Gaurav Sukhatme, my postdoc, and my three PhD students who've worked on this. And thank you for coming, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Any more questions? Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could comment on um, the state of large scale robotic ocean data collection. Is it, like, how many vehicles are operating in the world now, for example, and is that sort of a viable science, you know, method moving forward? Um, so in terms of the Slocum gliders, I believe there's something on the order of 100, you know, hundreds potentially in operation. Um, most of them are owned by various navies. Um, and then oceanographers use a number of them as well, so oceanographic institutions around the world. Um, so I think, you know, I, I, there is um, a lot of interest from DOD. DARPA is interested in what they call the ocean of things, where you have gliders, you have drifters, you have propeller-driven vehicles, you have ROVs, they're all communicating with each other, they're all gathering data. Um, and I think that there's a lot of potential for this, right? Like, I think that Ocean data is extremely important for energy, uh, for food, for climate, uh, for all of, a lot of the things that we really care about. And if we really want to learn about the ocean and potentially manage the ocean, we need to have these lo this large-scale data collection with lots of different assets that can get a lot of different data. Um, so I think it's, a, you know, it's an important area to invest in. Um, and it's you know, potentially what's going to happen with marine vehicles is what happened with UAVs, where you know, maybe there were a couple hundred, and then there are going to be thousands or uh, hundreds of thousands out there in a few years. I hope, at least, since I work in that area. Other questions? Yeah, Chris. So in your trajectory selection thing, you sort of had a smooth continuum of trajectories. But maybe showing people the second best trajectory, which mm. might reorder the visit sites, uh, and couldn't be continuously buried into the, the starting trajectory, would be a better way to go. Do you okay. have any idea how to compute the second or the third best trajectory? In a different homotopy class? Yes. Well, so I would uh, direct you to Maxim Likachev's research, potentially. Really? <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm sure you're not aware of that. Um, but uh, yeah, so we've done some work in planning in homotopy classes with tether constraint planning as the application. Um, and so, I mean, you can kind of divide the environment up into homotopy classes and then try to start a stomp in each homotopy class of interest. That might be an idea. 
other than that, you know, it, I, think, I think there's, so I am very interested in topological planning. Um, we're not quite there yet on the results, um, but trying to think about, well, what's a good way to create a diverse set of starting trajectories and then deform them, and then you can pick the best one out of that might be a potential way to go. Other questions? Thanks, Jeff. Thanks.